Hello, and welcome to the sixth webinar in our Lunch, Learn, and Dance wellness webinar series, PPE and Dissymmetry. I am Lynn McDonald, Liaison Scientist with the Radiation Safety Institute of Canada. Joining me in our chat room is Maria Costa and Natalia Moziani, our CEO. Kimberly Ramos from Arawaku Latin Dance Company in Toronto will lead us in dance beginning at 12.30. Let's take a moment to go over the functionality of the Zoom webinar. The audio and video will be from the presenters only. We have found that although you can access the audio through the computer or the telephone, the quality of sound tends to be better when listening from a computer. There is a chat feature where people can discuss. If you would like, take a moment now to say hello and where you are from. If you have questions arriving from the content, please enter them under the Q&A section. As the webinar is only a half hour in length and is immediately followed by our dance session, time may not permit for me to answer them during the webinar. The answers will be posted on our website along with a link to the video recording and a copy of the slides. This can be found under education webinars. I will be sending a confirmation of attendance email after the webinar and it will include a link to the page with that communication. I will also include the topics covered and the length of time spent in the webinar as some people have requested this to send to their professional association. Lastly, I have automatic closed captioning enabled in the slide presentation. If they are being blocked by your Zoom controls, you should be able to select a different way to view the webinar in Zoom, which will make them easier to see. In this webinar, we will first review what radiation is and the distinctions between ionizing and non-ionizing radiation, as well as particle versus electromagnetic radiation. We will go over aspects of a radiation protection program and regulation, internal versus external exposures, PPE types, and dosimeters. We will then overview PPE and dosimetry by radiation type and give information on who to contact to find out more specifics for your situation. Matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. In simple terms, energy is the ability to make changes in matter. When energy moves out from a source in streams of particles or waves, it is called radiation. Although we can speak more generally, when we discuss radiation, we will be speaking to material particles which emanate from unstable radioisotopes in an attempt to become stable, or electromagnetic radiation, which we can consider as waves or streams of particles called photons. In radiation protection, there is a distinction between forms of radiation which are ionizing versus those which are not. Non-ionizing radiation does not have enough energy to remove electrons from their orbits in the atom or molecule to which they belong. The damage they could cause is due to heating or photochemical effects. In terms of electromagnetic radiation, the frequencies or photon energies in the radio through mid UVB are non-ionizing. Ionizing radiation does have enough energy to remove electrons from their orbits. The possible health effects also include stochastic effects, which include an increased risk for developing cancer. As well, they may cause deterministic and tissue effects. For more information on health effects, please see the webinar, Health Effects of Exposure to Radiation. Ionizing radiation includes electromagnetic radiation in the mid UVB to the gamma and X-ray frequencies and all particle radiation from unstable radio isotopes, alpha, beta, and neutron. What happens when radiation hits matter depends upon how it interacts with the material on a molecular scale. This in turn depends upon the properties of the radiation. When radionuclides eject particle radiation to become more stable, they become in one of three types, alpha, beta, or neutron. Compared to the other types of particulate radiation, alpha particles have a large mass and charge, so they interact strongly with matter, but only travel short distances. Beta particles are much lighter in comparison and carry half the size of charge. They travel farther than alpha, but not as far as neutron, x-ray, or gamma. Neutrons have a mass that is about a quarter of that of an alpha particle, but about 2,000 times larger than a beta particle. Because of their lack of charge, they pass very easily through materials. Because of how they interact with matter, they can be very damaging, can cause secondary radiation, and are the only type of naturally occurring radiation that can make a material radioactive. The electromagnetic spectrum ranges from radius through gamma. 
If you go from low energy photons to high energy photons, mid UVB and above are ionizing. Gamma and X-rays are in the same energy range of the electromagnetic spectrum. However, X-rays are created with machines while gamma comes from the nuclei of unstable radioisotopes. We do not make this distinction for other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Visible light from the sun, for example, is not given a different name than visible light from a light bulb. Because of the added health and radiation protection concerns, sources of ionizing radiation tend to be federally regulated in Canada. With the exception of very small quantities of radionuclides and naturally occurring radioactive material, the CNSC records, requires people who have these types of sources to have a license, which includes many aspects to keep people in the environment safe. Equipment capable of creating high energy X-rays or high energy beams of particles also require a CNSC license. Non-ionizing and low dose X-ray equipment and particle accelerators are regulated provincially. As the regulations vary by province, please check with your provincial government for the specifics for your situation. Due to this variety, today we'll look to the CNSC for general best practices in ionizing radiation protection. We will also mention non-ionizing radiation protection where appropriate. A radiation protection program is there to keep doses as low as reasonably achievable, or ALARA. It includes the following, management control over work practices, personal qualification and, and training, control of occupational and public exposure to radiation, and planning for unusual situations. How do, sh do shielding and dissymmetry fit into these expectations? First, let's distinguish between internal and external radiation exposures. With internal exposure, the radiation source is inside the body. With current technology, internal exposures are only caused by radionuclides that are inside the body of the person receiving the radiation dose, not from human-made equipment. With external exposure, the source of radiation is outside the body. This distinction is important when it comes to both PPE and dissymmetry. Reducing external exposure is much easier than reduce, reducing internal exposure once the radionuclide enters the body. The three radiation protection principles for reducing external exposures are time, distance, and shielding. By reducing the time spent in the radiation field, keeping as much distance as possible away from the source of the radiation, and by using shielding to block or reduce the strength of the field, doses can be kept low. Different types of radiation require different types of shielding. Alpha particles can be stopped by paper or the dead surface of layer of skin. It is therefore only a concern if it gets inside you. Beta particles can travel through paper, but can be stopped with plastic or aluminum. Neutrons are highly penetrating and must be shielded with materials that have light nuclei. Gamma and X-ray can theoretically travel forever through matter, but by using dense materials like lead or concrete, their energy levels can be reduced to safe working levels. Non-ionizing radiation can be reflected away or blocked using materials that absorb its energy and dissipate it. It is important for those developing a radiation protection program to know the properties of the radiation being shielded. For example, if you shield beta radiation with lead, you could create x-rays, which then need to be shielded as well. PPE can have the purpose of being a form of shielding that you wear. Shown is typical PPE for working with gamma or x-rays. These items attenuate or lower the strength of the gamma or x-rays that hit the lead or lead equivalent material. PPE is also used to keep radioisotopes from entering the body via skin absorption, entering through broken skin, or being inhaled, ingested, or injected. These functions can be in combination with protection from external beta, neutron, gamma, or X-ray radiation if necessary, depending upon the source of concern. They can range from common PPE for biological contaminants to hazmat suits with respirators. Non-ionizing radiation PPE is designed to protect sensitive organs such as skin or eyes from damage. For PPE to offer the expected protection, it must be properly cared for and used. 
Before each use, inspect for damage and do not use if you have concerns. Damaged PEPE should be recorded and reported to your radiation safety officer or x-ray safety officer equivalent. For non-ionizing radiation, damage or missing PPE should be reported to management or their health and safety designate. Who is responsible for the cost of PPE depends upon jurisdiction. Lead or lead equivalent PPE should be screened annually for its abil ability to attenuate X-ray or gamma radiation. This is often done with fluoroscopy equipment, if available. PPE must have a proper fit to protect you. It cannot be too big or too small as this can lead to gaps in protection. PPE should be stored properly to prevent damage. In the case of lead aprons, it is especially important to hang them properly as folding or rolling them can lead to cracks in the protective material. PPE should be stored in a cool, dry place. Eye protection should be stored in protective cases to prevent scratches. Clean PPE, clean PPE according to the directions provided to you. For disposable PPE, which has any possibility of being contaminated with a radionuclide, follow proper disposal guidelines. This is not a concern with x-rays, but it is for unsealed nuclear sources or sealed sources which may be damaged or leaking. One last action to take is to check for service life of PPE. Depending upon the material and radiation source, there may be limits to the amount of time it can be used before it must be replaced even if it has been cared for properly and does not appear damaged. Some materials will degrade over time without noticeable changes to their physical appearance. The effects of radiation on a cell, tissue, organ, or human depend on how much energy is absorbed into it. A dose of ionizing radiation is a measure of how much energy is given to the body from the radiation and is used to indicate the effect it might have. There are three common ways dose is reported. Absorbed dose, which is the energy given to the body by radiation per unit mass, measured in gray. Equivalent dose, which also takes the type of radiation into account, measured in sieverts. And effective dose, which additionally considers the sensitivity of different tissues to radiation, which is also measured in sieverts. Depending upon the type of radiation, the way it is being used, and the regulator, what is monitored and reported varies. We have no senses to detect ionizing radiation. Exposure to it can lead to health consequences that appear days or years later, depending upon the strength of the dose, the tissue receiving it, and the type of damage incurred. For this reason, dosimetry is used to determine how much energy radiation has deposited into an individual. If exposures get too high, actions must be taken. The type of dosimetry program used depends upon the type of radiation expected to be encountered and the part of the body expected to receive it. A dosimetry program for external exposures would be different than that for internal exposures. If both types of exposures might be expected, then both types of program would be needed. Dose limits vary by regulator. This may seem concerning, but one must remember that these limits are not cutoffs under which, if occupational dose is kept, all is fine. These are maximums. The ALARA principle must be followed when it comes to occupational doses. By following safety protocols, doses in Canada on average are around 0.2 millisieverts per year, well under the effective dose limits. If dosimetry indicates that a worker is approaching the limit shown, it typically would be a cause for a review of the radiation safety program and adherence to such. External dosimetry is used when it is expected that the source is external to the body. As alpha is absorbed by the outer layer of, of skin, external dosimetry is used for beta, ionizing electromagnetic, and neutron radiation. Dosimeters are devices which measure how much energy radiation is depositing into it. This information is used to approximate how much energy the radiation has deposited into the tissues or body of the person wearing the dosimeter. They can be passive, which means that the measurement is taken from them at regular intervals, such as monthly, quarterly, etc., or active, which means that they give real-time measurement. Typically, only passive dosimeters can be used in Canada for official dose measurements, 
but active dosimeters are useful for detecting accidental high doses in situations where a high radiation exposure is possible. If only a passive dosimeter is used, this exposure may not become apparent until the dosimer, dosimeter is read. Depending upon the workplace, dosimeters can be static sample collection for the work area with worker doses extrapolated based on the time spent in the area and other factors, or personal. Personal dosimeters should not be used for workplace monitoring. Different designs of dosimeters have different strengths and weaknesses. The response of some depends upon the radiation energy and or the angle of incidence of the radiation. Most work best for specific types of radiation. Some, if not read in a timely manner, will become more difficult to read due to fading. Some respond more linearly than others to the dose, which means that the signal being read is more consistent despite the amount of energy being deposited. Some have lower minimum doses which can be read. Some can only be used once, while others can be used multiple times. This leads to the fact that some can save a dose over time, while others cannot. Another consideration is how easy it is to wear and how durable or rugged they need to be. The expectation for ruggedness and durability in a hospital setting, for example, is very different than for in a uranium mine. There are a wide variety of designs for dosimeters, too many to cover in a half hour webinar. We will therefore overview the most commonly used dosimeters in Canada. TLD stands for thermoluminescent dosimeter. Each TLD contains a detector or chip. When ionizing radiation passes through the chip, the energy it deposits will cause electrons to be ejected. These electrons become trapped in impurities called doping centers. The electrons stay in a high energy state until the chip is placed in a reader and heated. This process causes electrons to return to the preferred lower energy state by releasing a photon of visible light. The reader detects the emitted light and create what is called the glow curve. Analysis of the glow curve determines the dose. TLD dosimeters have different types of materials used as chips and come in a variety of formats, including badges, bracelets, and rings. Bracelet and ring dosimeters are used to measure dose to the extremities. TLD badges must be calibrated in order to be accurate. They are subject to signal fade over time. They are linear over a wide range of radiation energies. They can be reused as the previous reading is zeroed out at the end of the reading process. This also means that you cannot store the reading on the dosimeter. Reading the dosimeter can be done on site if the company has the equipment and expertise to do so. OSLD stands for Optically Stimulated Luminescent Dosimeter. They work in a similar fashion to TLDs, except the light curve is created by subjecting the chip to light instead of heat. Because of this, they are not affected by typical ambient temperature variations. They are more sensitive to low levels of radiation. OSLDs can be read more than once, stored for several years as an archival record, or reset so they can be reused. They are, however, more expensive than TLDs. They can also be read on site if the expertise and reader are available. DRD stands for direct reading dosimeter. A DRD provides real-time measurement of radiation dose. They do this using either a diode or a Geiger-Muller detector. While in almost all cases their measurement cannot be used as a person's official dose record, they are useful to give real-time monitoring for persons who work in strong radiation fields. Many models have alarms which can be set to bring attention to the fact that the person is in an area with a high level of radiation. For example, a DRD might trigger an alarm at a certain level so the nuclear energy worker is aware that they need to step away from a source because the dose rate is too high or leave the area altogether because they have re received enough dose for that workday. Remember, at acceptable occupational dose rates, we cannot use our own senses to detect ionizing radiation, so these dosimeters are invaluable to those who work in areas where strong radiation fields might be present. Neutrons interact with matter differently than other types of radiation. They interact most strongly with elements with low atomic numbers as they have light, lighter nuclei than ones with higher atomic numbers. 
For this reason, external dosimeters for neutrons are different than for beta, gamma, and X-ray. One type of neutron dosimeter is a solid state nuclear track detector. They are made of a special plastic called CR39. When neutrons hit the dosimeter and interact with the plastic, charged particles are released. This causes tracks in the plastic, which can be made visible through chemical etching. These tracks are then viewed and counted. The number of tracks is related to the dose received by the individual. Disadvantages of these dosimeters are that they depend greatly on the angle at which the radiation hits the dosimeter, and they are not sensitive to low doses of neutrons. Neutron dosimetry can also be performed using portable neutron survey meters. As you might imagine from the picture, they are area monitors and not personal dosimeters. The ball at the bottom is filled with a material with a lot of lightweight nuclei so that there are more opportunities for interactions between neutrons in the material than with a small badge. They are placed in areas where the neutron radiation is expected to be high and then the dose is calculated based on the reading and other factors. Dosimeters are meant to measure the dose the wearer experiences under their PPE. For this reason, they should be worn under a lead apron or other shielding PPE. If extre extremity dose is being measured, rings or bla bracelets go on the hands facing the radiation source. If the eye is particular, oh sorry, the eye is particularly sensitive to radiation, so it might be necessary to have a dosimeter worn on the collar above the apron or other PPE to measure eye dose. It is strongly recommended that those working at multiple locations have a different dosimeter for each location. In the case of an unusual exposure, this will make it easier to determine where the exposure was received. Dose recorded from each dosimeter must be communicated to the employee. Do not expose dosimeters to high temperatures, water, direct sunlight, or fluorescent light. Store is directed and away from radiation sources. Do not share dosimeters. They are meant to determine your personal dose. There should be extra dosimeters on site for visitors or to replace damaged or missing devices. Internal dosimetry is used when a person has a source of radiation inside the body. When this happens, the body will absorb the energy from radiation produced until it is no longer radioactive or the body eliminates it through normal processes such as exhalation, sweat, urine, or feces. To determine how much dose will be experienced by a person as these processes occur, measurements to determine what source and how radioactive it is are necessary. These include measuring the amount of gamma radiation which emanates from the person, how much of the isotope is present in his excreta such as urine or feces, or if sm small amount of internal radiation exposures are expected, using personal dosimetry or fixed monitors to measure the levels of these materials in the air. For example, uranium miners exposed to radon and radon progeny from the natural breakdown of uranium, as we all are. However, they work in areas with higher concentrations of uranium than most homes and workplaces. Radon and some of its progeny are alpha emitters with a short half-life. Exposure to radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer after smoking and has synergetic effects with smoking. The Radiation Safety Institute of Canada was created as an independent not-for-profit after the health effects of radon exposure in uranium mines at Elliott Lake were determined. More historical information is available on our website. As one part of its ongoing radiation safety mandate, we provide personal alpha dosimetry to uranium miners. The dosimeters, or PADs, use a piece of radiation-sensitive film that records tracks when radiation interacts with them similar to the nuclear track devices, but using a different mechanism. After developing, the film is read, tracks counted, and doses are determined. Because alpha radiation is of concern to the lungs, the PADs actively bring in air to simulate breathing. At the end of each workday, they are stored in charging stations. For cases where unexpected internal dose has incurred, different measurements recorded are used to determine what is called the committed dose. It is called this as the person does not receive the dose all at once, but rather over time as the body eliminates the substance and the substance goes through radioactive decay. 
In some cases, such as exposure to tritium from heavy water, increasing the rate at which someone sweats will increase the rate water containing the isotope is eliminated from the body and lower the committed dose. For other compounds formed with radioactive isotopes, they could be used to form body tissues such as bone and remain in the body for a long time. This is not said to scare anyone, but to emphasize the importance of following all safety protocols, cumbersome or not, in order to prevent exposure. There are three CNSC licensed service providers which report beta, x-ray, and gamma occupational dose to the National Dose Registry, NDR, National Dosimetry Services, Health Canada, Landauer, and Marion Technologies. The National Dose Registry keeps a record of individual cumulative dose over multiple licensed service providers and multiple employers. Because stochastic effects such as cancer have a long latency period, this service maintains these records for staff over their career, even if there has been a change of employer. Let's quickly look at the PPE and dosimetry consideration by radiation type, starting with ionizing and then moving to non-ionizing. For alpha particles, they do not penetrate our outer skin layer into living tissue. PPE is used to block routes of entry into the body. PPE can become contaminated by unsealed radioisotopes. If there's any possibility of contamination by a radioisotope, PPE must be cleaned or disposed of following proper protocols. Dosimetry for alpha emitters can be in the form of personal alpha dosimeters or internal dosimetry me measures. Beta particles can penetrate the skin. It can be shielded using plastic or aluminum. Using more dense materials can cause x-ray production, which must be shielded for as well. PPE might be needed to shield from beta and to block routes of entry for unsealed sources. Again, if there's any possibility of contamination by radioisotope, PPE must be cleaned or disposed of following proper protocols. Dosimeters used for beta radiation are TLDs and OSLDs. Neutron radiation is not found frequently in workplaces. They are typically found in nuclear reactors, high energy particle accelerators, or in very powerful nuclear gauges. Portable neutron sources have heavy shielding and engineering controls are used to keep people away from neutron radiation in facilities. If these measures are not sufficient, PPE would be used for shielding and to prevent internal exposure. As neutron radiation can produce secondary radiation, these would need to be shielded for as well. Shielding and PPE exposed to neutron radiation can become radioactive over time. In order to shield for neutrons, low atomic weight rich materials, including textile composites are used. Dosimetry for external neutrons is performed using solid state nuclear track dosimeters and portable neutron survey meters. Gamma radiation sources are typically well shielded with exposure possible when a shutter is open. PPE containing lead or lead equivalent is needed to protect from external exposure. PPE is needed to keep any unsealed source contamination from entering the body if this is of concern. Dosimetry is in the form of TLDs or OSLDs. X-ray sources cannot be internal and are shielded using PPE containing lead or lead equivalent. Dosimetry is with a TLD or OSLD. UV is ionizing in the high energy UVB and throughout the UVC range. Naturally occurring UVC from the sun is filtered by the ionosphere, but UVB does penetrate. Sunburn, skin, and eye cancer are of concern with exposure to UVB and UVC light. Possible workplace exposures are from welding arcs, curing lamps for resins and paints, sterilization lamps, tanning beds, and in medical and dental, pr dental practices. PPE includes welding helmets, gloves and coveralls, sunscreen with SPF, glass or plastic shields and eyewear designed for this purpose. Dental curing lamps may also be in UV or visible blue spectrum. Intense blue spectrum light can cause retinal degeneration, so perfect protective eyewear or shields are used as PPE. Dosimeters for UV exposure are commercially available, but depending upon the jurisdiction, they may not be required. More information on UV radiation will be given in an upcoming webinar. 
Laser radiation is not ionizing, but it can bl still blind or burn you badly. It can also generate airborne hazards or cause a fire. Depending upon the energy level, PPE is in the form of eye protection, protective clothing, and or air filtration. More information on laser protection will be provided in an upcoming webinar. Because it is non-ionizing, dosimetry is not applicable. Infrared sources damage tissues due to heating effects. If necessary, PPE is designed to protect from heating and may need to be flame resistant or retardant. Dosimetry is not applicable because it is non-ionizing. We have gone through a great deal of information, but there's a great deal more available on the subject. Unless you are the person responsible for setting up and implementing a radiation safety program, the additional information is likely excessive for what you need to know to keep yourself safe. We do hope, though, you remember the following. PPE and dosimetry are specific to the type of radiation and the situation in which it is being used. They are part of a complete radiation safety program. Procedures developed are not arbitrary, but have been developed with your protection in mind. If you're unsure what is expected of you, how to do it properly, or why it is important, please ask for help from the people responsible for your radiation safety in your workplace. To find out more information particular to your workplace duties, start with the person in your workplace responsible for your health and safety with respect to radiation. Depending upon the regulator, workplaces where there are, are potential exposures to ionizing radiation will have a radiation safety officer, if regulated by the CNSC, or a safety officer responsible for x-ray safety if provincially regulated. The title of the x-ray safety officer varies by province. For non-ionizing radiation, you should talk to your Joint Health and Safety Committee. If your workplace is too small to have a Joint Health and Safety Committee, talk to your employer. If you wish to explore the radiation protection legislation in Canada, Canadian Legal Information Institute website at canle.org has all current and most past legislation searchable in many different ways. That being said, unless you are very used to reading these documents, they're not easy to navigate. Including a, included at the end of this presentation, which will be printed as PDF and posted to our website, are several documents from the CNSC and the International Atomic Energy Agency with respect to PPE and dosimetry. The Radiation Safety Institute of Canada is also here to support any of your questions related to radiation safety, whether it be at work or at home. Founded in 1980, the Radiation Safety Institute of Canada is an independent not-for-profit organization offering a variety of informational, consultation, and laboratory services focused on radiation safety. We hope you have enjoyed this introduction to PPE and dosimetry. Remember, by having strong radiation protection regulations and following safety protocols, we can use radiation safely in our workplaces. If you have fur any further questions about ionizing or non-ionizing radiation, please feel free to contact us toll-free at 1-800-263-5803 or by email at info at radiationsafety.ca. Visit us on the web at www.radiationsafety.ca or find us on Facebook.